John chapter 10, verses 11 to 16. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. When he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must also bring them in. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. This is the Word of God. As I've told you already, today's sermon theme is what is world missions? And the answer is, and we're going to talk about it as we look at sections of both of our readings, world missions is extremely simple, extremely complex, and always inspiring. It's extremely simple. In our Old Testament lesson, did you notice the section began with the Lord saying, I am the Lord, there is no one else. And how did it end? I am the Lord and I am the only Savior. That's it. In Bible study, we talked about how that may be politically incorrect. It may be deemed and judged as arrogant to say such a thing. But so what? It's the truth. There is one Lord, one God, one Creator, one Savior, one Judge of all mankind. And at the end of this life, it's either heaven or or hell. And Jesus makes it very clear. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Apart from me, nothing. You see, that's why world missions, home missions, Messiah missions, family missions, is extremely simple. It's simply letting, going out there and letting the world know that there is a Lord, that He is God who created them, and they have nothing to be afraid of because He is the God who saved them. Isaiah was inspired to record this statement from the Lord, this call, turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. You see, it was designed to be extremely simple. God looked at the world and the big mess that mankind make, the big mess that we contribute to in this world and in our own lives, and God says, you guys are never going to sort this out. You're never going to be able to save yourselves. But I love you too much, and I'm not going to let you be damned for eternity because of what you have done. And I'm willing to pay the ultimate sacrifice. I'm willing to come and take the punishment that you deserve. And I'm willing to generously give you the status of holiness that is mine and bestow it upon you. Trust in my promise. Believe in me. Because there's no one else to trust in. And if you do trust in anything else, you're going to be sorely disappointed. And so, yes, thank you very much. This is a Sunday of reminiscing. When I was a missionary back in the 1990s, when I had, you know, I had about the same amount of hair then as I do now. It was just cut a little. And maybe, I don't know. Eh, I definitely look younger. I think I was 28, 29 when that picture was taken. Anyway, it was out in the village of Monshama. Sitting there next to me, you did figure out who I am and who the, Okay. Headman's on the left. Headman one on the left. I'm on the, the right. Anyway. Every time I would go out to the village of Monsham, and I'd usually get out there about every six weeks or so, because there was a number of, actually, about every month or, no, every two months, I'd get out there. In between, the layman of the congregation would preach from a sermon book and take care of the congregation. But when I'd come out, we'd have a big festival and we'd have communion, and babies would be baptized, and if there was anybody that needed instruction, or had instruction, been in instruction, and needed to be examined so they could be confirmed, that all took place. And we had this, this service, and we would go out, like when I go out to Monshama, 
Then after the service, I'd go down and see the head man because, as you can see, he's an older gentleman. He is not exactly in the prime of health. And what would I do? I would go down there. And do you happen to notice what I'm holding in my hand? Bible. Sitting, that very Bible sitting on the bookshelf in my office. It's a New Testament copy in the Nyanja or Chewa language. It was new then. You see it now. It's pretty beat up. But basically, I'd go down there and share with him a summary of what I had preached, give him the Lord's Supper. Basically, all I did was present and put before his eyes Jesus Christ. I wasn't there to tell him about myself, even though we'd have small talk and conversations. I wasn't there to convince him of the political activities of the West versus Africa versus the United States versus whatever was going on at that time. I came there to present Christ crucified. I was reminded of that fact because I don't know why, for some reason lately I've been reading a lot of papers about the Apache mission field. And I was reading a paper written by a historian of the field and he quotes one of the earliest missionaries down there. And it was a huge, we talked about it in Bible study, a huge obstacle for these Midwestern German pastors to go down to the territory of Arizona, that's what it was at the time, and reach out to these Apache people whose English was not so good. And we're talking about times where not that long ago, the white people, the soldiers came in and made, made everybody go on the reservation and the wars with Geronimo, it wasn't that long. And there was a lot of fear of going, how are we going to overcome language? How are we going to overcome culture? How are we going to overcome this animosity of distrust between the red man and the white man? And the missionary is quoted to have said, and rightly so, I'm going to keep it extremely simple. When I speak with them, I don't want them to see me, even though they will. But I want to direct their eyes and their hearts to Jesus Christ. When they finished a conversation with me, what I want them to remember is not what I said or who I am or how nice a guy I am. I want them to remember how loving their God is and how God sent his son to be the savior of the world. I don't want them to think about whether or not me and my people are going to continue our current policies through the Bureau of Indian Affairs or not. I want them to think about how God will continue to bestow his grace, his love and care upon white and red man alike. See, it's that simple. It's that simple being a parent. It's that simple being a Christian spouse. It's that simple being a door-to-door -door witness. Talking to someone in yoga class. It's that simple talking to somebody at work. It's that simple having a conversation about what you believe in baptism with a group of friends having coffee. You just simply say, this is who Jesus is. This is what he has done. This is why I believe in him. And by the way, he wants all people from every end of the earth to turn to him, trust in him, call him Lord, and be saved. It's that simple. No more complex. It's holding up and saying, here's Jesus, who he is, what he's done, and he's done it for you. And the neat thing is, as has been proven throughout the centuries, exemplified on the pages of Scripture the day of Pentecost, with 3,000 being baptized that day, and through the centuries, hundreds upon thousands upon millions, including ourselves and our ancestors, have heard that promise, probably brought to us by somebody we didn't know, and the Holy Spirit moved us to trust in that promise. And that's why we're here today. It's that simple. But I also said it's complex, which it is. If we take a look at the next picture, if you take a look at it, you can spend some time guessing which one's my son. Anyone? Anyone? I know it's extremely easy because two of them are girls. I know that. Jesus says, as he said, I'm the good shepherd, I lay down my life for the sheep, and so on. He hints at that complexity. Even though I think when the disciples were hearing him say it the first time, 
they didn't really think about or probably didn't comprehend exactly how complex it would be. But Jesus makes it very clear. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. They too will listen to my voice. Those words, other sheep pen, are loaded. We talked about it a lot in Bible study. It's what Peter experienced when the Lord said to him, all right, now you're going to be going to Cornelius' house. He didn't say that, but that was what was going to happen. You're going to go to Cornelius' house. He's not Jewish. He doesn't come from the same background as you. He doesn't come from the same culture of you. You're going to now be actually called to worship and to preach and to teach and interact with people who are not like you, people of other sheep pens. And Peter had to go, as we talked about in Bible study, had the Lord prepared him by saying, here, Here's a whole bunch of unclean animals, things that you've been taught forever that are not good, that you don't like, that would be appalling to your sensibilities, your cultural sensibilities. Now I want you to eat that. And we think, and rightly so, we talked about it in Bible study, that the opposition to Christian mission work is, oh, the world hates us. And they do. And the devil is out there, and he is. But here, subjective opinion being shared based on personal experience and observation. The biggest challenge to overcome when it comes to doing mission work does not come from the devil and does not come from the world around us. It's in here. It's fear of the unknown. It's fear and frustration with the unfamiliar. It's an uneasiness of being dragged out of or willingly stepping out of our comfort zone. The reason I say that is based on some of these experiences. Some of the experiences that I dealt with when I was called to be a world missionary. Leslie and I and the kids arrived in Zambia. And again, Leslie can tell you about all the challenges of trying to take care of a young family in a different culture, a different world, different economy, and all sorts of things. Flying cockroaches and bugs in your flour and all sorts of neat stuff. Fingernail clippers in your loaf of bread. Ask her about all of that. Ew. I thought it was just a prize, like at the bottom of the cereal box. But anyway, anyway. But for me, it was the, okay, welcome to the mission field, young Pastor Mulkey. Uh, enjoyed that seminary training? Okay, good. Now what I want you to do is, first thing you need to do is learn Nyanja. You go out there, preach, teach, and do all that. And then after you get that nailed down, why don't you just jump right in and learn that Lenje language, because that'll help you too. Okie dokie. And I went, you know, I got D's and C's in Hebrew, Greek, Latin, German, and I hated it. Even though I knew it was a good... It wasn't until we started translating the Bible that I went, okay, now finally, something that I know I want to do. But I was given a lot of good encouragement and advice. And the best advice that I was given and I would give to anyone else is, don't be afraid. I said, why? I said, well, how did you learn English? Hmm. Well, I signed up for a class at preschool. No. You listened. And you repeated. And you tried. And you failed. And you tried again. And you got some correction. And you kept working on it. And eventually, with a lot of effort, you got those words, Mama and Dada nailed. And then you built from there. They said, treat this the same way. And one of the biggest frustrations that many a world missionary has encountered is that <clears throat> I am a seminary graduate of Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary. I have gone to four years of college. I have graduated from the seminary. I have a piece of paper hanging on my wall, and I sound like an absolute idiot trying to carry on a simple conversation with somebody. Hi, my uh, name, no, uh, wha, uh, mm, uh. and then your first devotions and sermons go something like this, if you could understand the local language. It would sound like this. Jesus, good, good, yes, good. Devil, devil. Not bad, bad, no, bad. Uh, forgiven. Trust Jesus only. Amen. I worked for four years at seminary to get a sermon out like that. But the people were so gracious. And the frustration slowly 
little by little, went away. There still were those embarrassing points along the way. By the way, in one of the languages, the word to you are dismissed sounds a lot like to vomit, but you have to kind of balance that out. So you got to watch those things. But they eventually turn, the Lord blesses that and turns it into great joy. And a little bit later, as we're receiving the Lord's Supper, I want you to know this is nothing new. But as I'm participating and distributing the Lord's Supper and hearing the words around me, take, eat, take, drink, honestly, in the back of my mind, I'm still hearing, Tengani, Ediani. When we break into prayer, our Father who art in heaven, in the back of my mind, it's still, A joy that came forth from the fruit of frustration. Complexities, we talked about in Bible study, foods, Cultural nuances, habits, all sorts of things you have to learn. For many Americans coming to a culture in like Africa and other places, this is not God we have to learn. It is an event. People don't show up at church right on time. The other side is nobody's going. Eh, 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 eh. It's like, hey, we're doing church. We'll be done when we're done. We'll get started when we get started, and we'll get done when we get done. So let's just enjoy. That kind of grates on people that have been taught their whole life. Uh, churches from 9 o'clock to 10 o'clock at 10.15, we begin Bible study. It's a little bit different. But there are pluses and minuses to it all. The bottom line is that God doesn't care about whether your culture is one that's ruled by the watch or ruled by the event. God doesn't care whether your culture is one that when they sing, you got to move or you're taught to stand still. The good Lord does not care about all those cultural things. He looks at that and says, this is part of the beauty and variety of my creation, the people that I have died for, that I live for, that I have redeemed, and I want in my kingdom. God does not care. Whether the prayer begins, Atatiatu, our Father, Fater Unzer, he doesn't care. What he hears is the heart of one of his redeemed saying, You are the one in whom I trust, you are the one whom I love, and you are the one who I give thanks to. World missions can be extremely complex. But it also can be extremely inspiring. As I prepared for this sermon, I pulled off my bookshelf this ledger book that I got many, many years ago before we even moved to Zambia. I got it because I thought this might come in handy. I didn't even know how I was going to use it. But there were no computers, and there definitely was no, even the early computers that were around back then, we wouldn't have had in Zambia. And I thought, eh, this could come in handy. When I got there, I found a good use for it. In these pages are recorded the names and places and dates and, where possible, birth dates of every individual that I had the privilege of baptizing, confirming, and quite a few funerals. The total, 772 baptisms in nine years, 258 confirmations, averaging 85 baptisms a year, 28 confirmations a year. That's just the little area that I worked with. What was behind all that were all the lay preachers and teachers who did the regular instruction, the families that overcame the threat of superstition and family pressure and brought their children to be baptized. In this book are recorded these names. On February 16, 1992, the very first baptism, Cynthia Nasalele. I'll never forget that day. It's the first day I went out to a church by myself. The plan was 
I'm going to read the liturgy in the local language. I could pull that off with a lot. Very, it was very rough, but I could do that. I could get by with basic readings. Remember, this is February. We had arrived late October. The play preacher was going to read the sermon. However, I arrived there and they said, Pastor, we have some children to be baptized. <laughs> okay. Well, I know where Matthew 28 is in the Bible. And I could choke out. I figured I could get the, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit out. And we got through it. Never forget it. But despite all my failings, all my frailties, all my incompetence, the Lord on that day used me to be a conduit along with that Christian congregation to bring another child into the kingdom of God. I went through the list a little bit more. I won't read off all 772 baptisms because that would be like one of those genealogy things. But another one I noted was on June 18, 1994, there was a young man named Anton Pity who was confirmed. I remember Anton. I saw Anton a couple years ago. Oh, yeah, that's the same Anton who is now the dean of students at our seminary in Lusaka. And I was extremely humbled at a missionary seminary conference a couple years ago where he presented a paper. And as he talked about his development in Christian ministry, he said, and I'm, <laughs> just to illustrate the point of inspiring, please forgive me if this comes off in any way arrogant, he mentioned me by name as a model of being a Christian pastor that he wanted to follow. That's humbling and inspiring all wrapped in one. I go down the list a little bit more. I get to August 13th, 1995, and I'm out at a village in Lifambula. Lifambula by itself is an amazing place because it was a congregation that a layman, one of the, the chairman of the congregation about a five, six-hour walk away, had friends over there and went over there and said, hey, I think I'll start a church. I'll start sharing the Word of God with them. I'll start using the teaching materials and teaching them. And finally, he says, oh, by the way, Pastor Mulkey, we have a church over there. Could you visit? Sure. By the way, that happened like three, four times. I get there. I meet the group. Second time I go to visit, Everything's kind of getting more order. They've already started building a church, which is just this little simple mud hut, but it's there. And it's August 13th, 1995 at Lifuambula, and everything's getting organized. And basically on that day, there were 28 baptisms. I'll never forget it because the little church was way too small. And so we just went outside and we lined everybody up. A line longer than one of our communion lines and there they were, and you just simply went down, the chairman from the local congregation holding the water, taking the water. And I went, child, 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 mother, child, child, adult, aged person, child, adult. God's kingdom. Other sheep being brought in. Let's take a look at this last slide. Speaking of confirmations, on May 14th, the year 2000, four individuals were baptized at the English-speaking congregation in town. Ava Makalabai and Henry Ndovu. Henry Ndovu was just a very kind-hearted, simple man, came to church faithfully, went through Bible study, was confirmed. Ava, lawyer by profession, lawyer circling in the circles of the national federal supreme court circles came to our church one day i asked her well you've been to a lot of different churches you've told me a lot about a lot of different places i'm really happy why are you here she goes you guys teach the word of god you don't just talk about it you actually dig into it and teach it this is where i want to be those two adults had gone through instruction and were confirmed at the same time on the very same day our oldest daughter, Elizabeth, and our next-door neighbor boy, Adam, were confirmed with them. Really brought out that regardless of who you are, what age you are, what confirmation is all about, it's not a rite of passage. It's not something you do when you're a certain age. 
It's standing before your Christian friends and saying, I truly do believe and I promise to be faithful even till death. Other memories that inspire? Ah, not enough time. Too many to even enumerate. But that's why when you hear me talk about world missions, there's a glint in my eye. Why I get just a little bit excited. Because it isn't just my personal experiences that I can hold on to and see. As I've had the privilege of reading reports, traveling around the world, interacting with other missionaries in my role during the past number of years, I see those stories that I have repeated over and over again everywhere in the world. And to me, the illustration is that there is one flock and one shepherd. And today, as we receive the Lord's Supper, there have been Christians at altars like this one. There have been Christians worshiping in countries where they are persecuted. There are Christians worshiping in countries where people have walked hours and miles to come to church. There are Christians who have placed the best shoes on their feet that morning to come to church because the best shoes they own are the one pair of rubber rain boots. And even though it's bone dry outside, they wanted to get ready and do something special because they're going to worship the Lord. And they are part of that one flock that we are part of. They may not be standing shoulder to shoulder with us this morning taking communion, but they have received and they do receive the very same body and blood of Jesus Christ given for them and given for us. And even though they're not going to be shoulder to shoulder with us this morning, they will be shoulder to shoulder with us on that day we stand before the throne of glory. The Lord said world missions is extremely simple. I am the creator of the world. I am the savior of the world. And my good news is for the whole world. Yes, in this world, as you carry that message to the world, there's going to be some frustrating, complex things. You're going to have to deal with the realities of different languages. You're going to have to learn to tolerate and put up with one another because you come from different cultures and different backgrounds. But what will always bring you together is a unity of faith that you have in trusting in the one good shepherd. I pray that that message may always be inspiring. If you ever get the privilege or ever have had the privilege of being part of it, it will change your life. Even if it's only for one week working in some mission field close by. For those of you that have gone out and knocked on doors and actually engaged in a conversation, overcoming the frustration and fears, you know that it has changed your life. And will it be a memory that you will hold on to for the rest of your life? May the Lord continue to bless us as we constantly engage in the mission of the church, witnessing the truth to one another, teaching the word of God to our children, praying for one another, and taking the message of Jesus Christ to people all around us, near and far. May the Lord continue to bless us in the joy of his mission work. Amen. We continue with our mission work as we gather our offerings for the day.